What's up guys, welcome back to another video of the Furniture Flipping Entrepreneur. In this video, I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of exactly the strategy I use so that you'll be able to spot a piece of furniture and determine its value right away, just like me. Okay, so what I love about this strategy is it's pretty much the difference between furniture flipping as a hobby and furniture flipping as a business. It's a model that you can follow for every piece of furniture and have relatively similar results each time. So essentially, you're systematizing your process, which is gonna make your business a lot more efficient and a lot less stressful, and in my opinion, a lot more fun because I can work less and make more money which makes me happy, which makes me happy. Okay, so the simple strategy that drives all of my results is broken up into three simple categories. You have to know your market, you have to determine the quality of the piece of furniture, and you have to know how to increase the value. Keep in mind, furniture flipping works in local markets. I'm working out of Austin, Texas, but if you're in another part of the country, you're gonna be in potentially a totally different market. So you have to figure out how your market is the same as other markets and how your market Market is different than other markets. Now, when I first got started, I didn't know what was popular in my market. So the way I combated this is I got online and I was looking for things that were popular across all markets that were doing well in multiple cities. And that way I could infer that changes are do well in my city as well. Once you have a few basic trends or concepts, you just need to start flipping furniture. The fastest and best way to learn furniture flipping is by just doing it. So once you get those concepts, you need to start rolling with it. My experience has shown that right now across most markets, these are the things that sell the fastest and the most consistently. And wooden furniture, dressers, vanities, and bookcases are the things that I only focus on. In upholstery furniture, I only focus on sofas and chairs. Now to break that down even further, with wooden furniture, I'm only looking for vintage and antique items. Vintage being pretty much a time period between the 1940s and 1980s and antique being anytime up to the 1940s. Things that help me spot vintage furniture are sometimes a boxy shape, sometimes there'll be thin legs, and also I'll keep an eye out for curvy or wavy fronts to the furniture. Now I probably sound like a caveman, but this is literally how simplistic my approach is to looking for vintage furniture. Antique furniture, I'm just looking for something that's really old, unique looking, potentially has hand carved elements and might be made from really solid wood. For upholstered items, I'm looking for sofas and I'm looking for chairs. It has to be modern, mid-century inspired. So a boxier shaped sofa with thin legs. It has to be made from velvet. It's an Ikea couch, it's white or really bright colored, and it's clean. For chairs, I'm only looking for swivel rockers, velvet chairs, and chairs that are bright colors. Okay, so now you know the types of furniture that sell the fastest and the most consistently across most markets. Now you're gonna have to determine whether or not those items pass the quality test. With wood furniture, I always ask myself these yes or no questions. The more yeses I get, the better it passes the quality test. Does it have a brand name? Is it made out of solid wood and not particle board or MDF? Do the drawers have dovetailed joints? Do the drawers slide in and out well? Is there any hardware missing? And lastly, how many holes need to be patched? If you answered yes to all those questions, then you have a quality piece of wooden furniture. If you answered no on any of those, you can still potentially flip it, but it's gonna require more time, energy, and money to get that piece of furniture market ready. For upholstered furniture, like the chairs and sofas, I have another yes or no quality test. This time the question's being, is there a brand name? Are there no stains? Are there no rips? Is there no odor? And a big one, are there no cat scratches? I have flipped upholstered furniture that has stains and rips, but when it comes to odors and cat scratches, those are almost always hard passes for me. Those are gonna be pieces of furniture that are really hard to resell. All right, moving right along. We now have the type of furniture that we know will perform well in our market. We have determined the quality of that piece of furniture. And now the last 
last stage. We have to increase the value. You won't know how much you can sell a piece of furniture for until you have an idea of how much added value you can inject into that piece of furniture. For wooden furniture, ways I add value are through paint, and I almost exclusively paint in pastel colors and charcoal black. For the sheen, I have personally never gone above a satin. The reason for this, I think once you start getting above a satin, the furniture looks kind of like it's kitchen cabinets from the 90s. It's too glossy. And I almost always spray paint the hardware a metallic gold. This is the only piece of the furniture that I think it's okay to have a glossy sheen. Next with wooden furniture, I could patch holes. Fixing scratches, holes, dings can sometimes take a lot of time because it requires time for the plastic wood to dry, but it's a really easy value add because it makes such difference and it's so simple. For a more in-depth video about exactly how I refurbish my furniture, be sure to check out this video above. Okay, these next two ways to increase value on furniture might seem kind of obvious, but sometimes it's the only value you need to add to flip a piece of furniture. Those two things being pictures and free delivery. As I mentioned in this video last week, I flipped an Ikea chair by just taking better pictures and I made a hundred bucks. And if you can offer free delivery, it facilitates the purchase of heavy, big furniture that normally somebody wouldn't be able to get online if they don't have a truck. So you're providing a value by making it more convenient for the customer to buy the furniture. For upholstered furniture like sofas and chairs, I'll typically just give them a really good clean with my Bissell upholstery vacuum. And with swivel rockers, I'll do this simple trick where I just pull off the skirt and it gives it a much more trendy look that's really popular right now. I might also paint the swivel beneath the chair, either black, gold, or sometimes I'll even throw in like a really quirky color to give it a particular look and attract a certain client. Other than that, with upholstered furniture, I again just add value through pictures and free delivery. So if you're wondering to yourself, how much exact value did I add in like a dollar amount? I answered that question using a few different factors. I asked myself, what is the cost of living in my area? What is the comparative value? What are my financial goals? And how much time and money have I invested in this particular piece of furniture? So let me give you an example of what this means. The example I'll use is a pink dresser that I just finished up yesterday. Before I post my listing price, I take into account the cost of my area which being in Austin, Texas, the cost of living is very high. So people expect to spend more money. I'll determine the comparative value by looking at similar dressers on Facebook Marketplace and around shops in my local area. I know the price of similar dressers are right now in Austin, Texas, selling for around 150 to $700. Next, I'll take into account my particular financial goals. I know I have to make $1,500 per month to meet my bare minimum requirement for bills. If I'm about to reach my deadline quickly, I might sell this for a more affordable price than I normally would. But if it's at the beginning of the month and I have plenty of time to sit on it before it sells, then I can ask for its maximum amount that I know I'll get. And lastly, I spent probably close to 12 hours in total working on this particular dresser, fixing holes, sanding it, painting it, sealing it. it took a good amount of time, so I wanna make sure I get my fair compensation for that work. So all of these things being taken into consideration, I decided to list this dresser for $550. That is a price that people can afford in Austin, Texas. It's a price within the range of other similar pieces of furniture. It's an agreement with my financial goals that are $1,500 per month. And that comes out to around $45 per hour, which I'm happy with. Also, keep in mind, you can always go down in price. It's a lot harder to go up in price after you make the posting. You can see your engagement metrics on Facebook Marketplace. So take note of those and also take into account the amount of time that has passed that your item hasn't sold. And then based on those two factors, you can lower the price over time. I generally start lowering the price a week or two after I've made the listing and it hasn't sold. Okay, so there you have it. That's the specific strategy I use for looking for furniture that I can flip and determining its resale value. I've put a copy of the checklist I use for my strategy in the description down below. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like and subscribe. That way you'll be sure not to miss any future videos about how to make a furniture flipping business.